If I can invite you back to your chairs, and if you are in need of a Bible, there are some in the back. You're welcome to take one and follow along, and if you'd open your Bible to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 26 and verse 36, Matthew chapter 26 and verse 36. As many of you, if not probably all of you, are aware, this week ended several weeks of violence in our city. There were, before the end this week, moments of fear and anger in our broader community. And then that was concluded with a moment of tragedy and for many, shock, when the identity of the young man who had been placing those bombs in this city was discovered. It was painful, it was shocking, partially because many of us, if not all of us, could identify with this young man's background, with the earnest and (laughs) eager intentions of his parents to raise him in a very different way. For some people that that knew him or knew his family, this is personally tragic as they weep with his parents. Certainly there's others in our community that knew or were new people that knew uh, the victims of this series of crimes. And so in, in general, this is just a moment of encountering the reality of this broken and fallen world, so much so that I I thought it would be helpful. We thought it would be helpful, though I know it's Palm Sunday, to look ahead a bit in the week and also to seize a moment and ask the question, where can we go in moments like this for comfort and help and illumination? Whether you were personally connected to the events of this week through some relationship or, or whether you, you weren't and yet you know of other moments in your life past or other moments you fear in the future perhaps where unexpected suffering, unanticipated trial comes into your life. We need the comfort that the scriptures can provide. And in particular, as we look at a particular garden, the Garden of Gethsemane, In the book of Matthew, chapter 26, let's read about this garden. Just the first few verses and description of Jesus there, beginning in verse 36. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father... If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Lord, would you bless the preaching of your word. I'm not going to walk through every element of this passage the way we normally would on a Sunday. I I, want to actually make uh, four points for how the Garden of Gethsemane and Jesus' sorrow in Gethsemane speaks to us in a moment like this in Austin, in Round Rock, in our broader community, but also how it speaks to us really in any moment of mysterious and difficult suffering, that this scene with our Savior 
suffering intensely as he anticipates the coming cross, it, it informs us, it communicates something to us that is profound that God wants to use to comfort us, I think, when we are aware of or when we face moments of intense suffering. It, it's very valuable to go, as it were, to Gethsemane and sit there and watch Jesus suffer. And I think at least it communicates four points of comfort to us. So if I could title this message, it would be the comforting tears of Gethsemane. How does the pain of Jesus in the garden comfort us when we face moments, as we did this week, of intense and mysterious suffering? How does it comfort us? Four, four ways. First, Jesus' suffering in Gethsemane affirms our grief and horror at sin. It affirms our grief and horror at sin. If you look down there at the passage, Jesus goes into this garden. He asks his disciples to pray, and then he goes with Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he begins to be sorrowful and troubled. And then Matthew repeats, quoting him, he said, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. So he is as sad as one can be and still be alive. So you might translate that. He's as sad as you can be to such a degree that his breaking heart is, as it were, killing him. Even unto death, he says. So there, there's no sadness that we've experienced that is as deep, as profound, as painful, as, as heartbreaking as this very sorrowful moment of Jesus Christ. And of course, since we know the story, we know why. What cup is it that he is contemplating? Well, it is the cup that is given to him because, because of his task of bearing sin on behalf of his people. Of, of facing the consequences of sin on behalf of his people. That's the cup that he is facing. That's the, the event that is causing him to be so much in agony, so much in pain, so much in grief. This is why this is important for us. The Bible does not treat suffering and mystery and difficulty as something we're just to face with a chipper look on our face, a, a, a platitude, a, a kitchen magnet, because our Savior himself, in facing the, the incredible prospect of being made sin, of being covered with the sins of his people, and facing the consequences of that sin, is in agony of sorrow. So no, the Bible and Gethsemane don't come to us and say, just put a good face on it. Just trust and believe God and don't worry too much about the sorrow of things. No, Jesus himself, the innocent one, is in agony to death at the prospect of facing the horrific consequences of sin. And when we face a moment like we did this week, whether we're personally somehow connected in relationship or whether we're just aware of it and it grieves us as fellow human beings. It's important for us to know the, the, the Garden of Gethsemane affirms what we feel when we think about the shock and disillusionment and disappointment and, and the sense of sadness and pain and the fact that there, there, are, there are no easy solutions to this, good guys and bad guys. It, it's hard to even see clearly in this. We see victims and we see a, a, even a perpetrator who's just caught and ensnared in sin. And, and we look at this and think, oh, it's just horrific. The whole thing is, is just terrible. We think of, of children who no longer have their, their father. We think of, of parents who no longer have their child. We, we think of just terrible, horrific effects of sin. And something in us says, this is, this is awful. This is not the way it should be. And sometimes, I think, in our own hearts or in the church, we, we pass too quickly over that experience. We sometimes hear that from others or even experience that ourselves and have kind of a false idea that we're, we're just supposed to be chipper in the face of a moment like that. We're supposed to maybe have a platitude and God worked all things for good. 
And sometimes even in counseling others, we, we, we sort of don't affirm the grief and the horror and the sorrow because it's, it's, it's raw and it's difficult and it's awkward and it's painful and it doesn't fit into a, a nice world in which you obey and do the right things and you always experience blessing. And we want that to be the case. We want it to be the case that as long as you do the right things and say the right things and, and lead your family the right way, eventually it results in this obvious blessing where you avoid suffering in some significant way. But that is simply not the case in this world. We face a, a painful reality. This world is broken by sin. And it is good for Christians to spend a while with the Savior in Gethsemane and listen to his cries. He falls on his face. Why? Because of the prospect of the outrage of God against sin reveals how horrific sin really is. So as there's this affirmation, I think it is right to feel a horror and a grief at the destructive and evil nature of sin, the chaos that it creates, the lives it destroys. That's how God thinks about sin, and God thinking that way is why Jesus is so grief-stricken, because he knows it is no light thing for humans to have so destroyed God's world. It is a heavy thing. It is the heaviest thing. So, brothers and sisters, I, I want to affirm you. If, if, if you're one of those that you find yourself deeply affected by these kinds of events, whether in our local community or just broadly in the world, I know some Christians in particular, when they hear about evil taking place in the world, even in other countries and, and severe suffering, they, they are deeply affected by that. They deeply feel the horror of that. There's something of a, 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 an outrage of grief and even righteous anger at the fact of evil present in the world. Brothers and sisters, if you're a Christian and you feel some of those things deeply, and it just, it just takes you out on a given day. You hear some news and it just takes you out. You just can't keep going. You can't stop thinking about your children in, in this future world or your, your life in this future world or just the state of this world and the, the suffering that takes place. It just takes you out. It takes out your joy in the day and suffering. All you're aware of in that moment is the horror and grief of it all. I, I think there's something comforting in knowing God thinks about it that way too. God, your God, thinks about it that way too. Jesus was not some chipper, happy person who just couldn't understand sorrow because of the effects of sin. No, he fell on his face. He said, I'm sorrowful unto death. So what does the Gethsemane do for us? Well, it affirms something in us. You're not crazy. You're not insane. You're not some just weirdly depressed person to think that this is grieving and horrific. Jesus thought so too. It affirms our grief and horror at sin. Second thing it does, it invites us to trust him and share him as the only hope. It invites us to trust him and share him as the only hope. To go to Gethsemane with Jesus and to hear him pray to his father reminds us who this is that is in such an agony of anticipation. This is the Son of God. This is the Eternal One. Gethsemane is packed with irony. You have the, the Eternal Son of God agonizing and pleading with his heavenly father to let this cup pass from him. So you have in Gethsemane the mystery of Jesus' two natures in one person uh, taking place. The divine son, who in his divine nature knows all things, chose to take onto himself a human nature that does not know all things. And in that human nature, which he fully experienced and was not mitigated by his divinity, in other words, Jesus did not experience pain on the cross, because he was divine. He was divine, and yet in his human nature, he experienced life the way humans do. 
And in this moment, he is aware that in his human nature, he cannot know everything. And in that human nature, he pleads, if it is possible, take this cup from me. There's a, there's a mystery of his nature here. And yet the silence of his father to answer that request and say, yes, it, it is possible. Let me remove this cup from you speaks to us that this divine son is the solution to the agony and grief of sin. Why is the perfect son in agony? Why is the righteous son of God in torment? Why? Because he was going to bear the curse of sin for us. What cup is he facing? The cup of the curse for all of those horrific acts of sin of his people, which he will drink to the full on the cross. That is why he was in agony. So for him there is a terror, yet for us there is a hope. What hope do we have as we face this horrific world? and the horror of our own sin in this world. What hope do we have? That Jesus Christ would drink our cup for us. That Jesus Christ would face the wrath of God for us. That he would say to his Father, not my will, but yours be done. And he would go to the cross for us. So that the darkness of this world was poured out on Jesus Christ, and he suffered the wrath of God, so that sinners who otherwise would only have chaos and grief to look forward to forever, can instead turn to Jesus and say, you bore that grief and horror for me, and now I receive the cup of salvation. What does Gethsemane call us to do? Well, it calls us to say that if the divine son of God is suffering this agony because he's going to bear the sin of sinners, we certainly can rejoice that we no longer need to bear that sin and the punishment of it for ourselves. Jesus didn't go to the cross because he thought it would be a nice example for people in enduring suffering. He went to the cross. He was in such an agony because he wanted to take away the punishment for sin that every sinner faces. There's only ever been and there only ever will be one Gethsemane just like there will only ever be one cross, only ever one innocent sufferer. So the uniqueness of this moment comes to us as an invitation. You must cling to this one who suffered God's wrath in your place. You must cling to this one. When you are aware of the horror of your own sin, when I'm aware of the horror of my own sin, when I see the sin of this world and realize God's wrath against that sin, it compels me to cling to Jesus, to cling to Jesus Christ, that he is the only hope. The only hope I have is that he bore that agony for me. It invites us to trust Jesus and to share Jesus as our only hope. Didn't didn't the events of this week motivate us? Doesn't the evil generally of this world motivate us to take the good news of Jesus? Jesus, if if you see an evil world, we understand the, the world is full of evil and unknowns and danger and mystery and sorrow. And if you want to be delivered out of this world, we have good news for you. We know one who bore all of that and will take it from you finally in eternity if you will trust in him. It compels us to share that news with those who are facing the fragility of life and and the surprising grip of sin It it, it compels us to trust him and to share him as the only hope. I I, I guarantee you this week there's going to be so many people who will look for ways to distract themselves from the grief that they heard and read about this week. There'll be so many people. They're going to look for ways to distract themselves. They're going to find some way. I just don't want to think about it. I I don't want to think about this anymore. So they'll 
go out to eat, they'll watch a movie, they'll binge watch something on Netflix, they'll do any number of things to try to move themselves away from the stark reality that moments like this and in our world moments like this bring, that there is a life and a death, there is evil and good, and all of us live in this world and participate in it. And what it should do is compel us and press us to the one person who endured all of that in our place so that we could be rescued and go into a new world. Don't give in to the idol of distraction when life presses into you and forces you to press yourself to Jesus. If I can just speak to young people. Listen, there is no protection against the power and punishment of sin except in the death of Jesus. Jesus didn't agonize in that garden for no reason. He agonized because he wanted to save sinners, and he is the only one that can. There is no protection, no protection, no protection. There is no protection because you have godly parents. There is no protection because you come to church. There is no protection because you've been well-trained, because you know the mantra of the Christian life. There is no protection except you going to Jesus Christ and claiming him as your personal Savior. There is no protection against sin, its punishment, and its effects in your life except that you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior. That is the only refuge for you. There is no background. There is no training. There is no relationships. There is nothing that can rescue you. It's not a rescue that you're sitting here on a Sunday morning. It's not a rescue that you know Bible verses. There is no rescue but you placing your soul in the hands of Jesus and saying, you must save me or I cannot be saved. So what does this kind of week do? And just the general evil of our world do. It invites us to trust Jesus and to share him as the only hope. Gethsemane does that. Because it reminds us there is a savior. There is a savior in this dark world who stared the evil of this world in the face and bore the wrath of it. And that savior offers himself to every sinner. Third thing I think Gethsemane does to comfort us. It compels us to trust God in mystery. It compels us to trust God in mystery. I think it does this in two ways. First and most importantly, it compels us to trust God because God himself is there in the garden suffering agony and anticipating the cross because of God's love for his people. There is no personal reason why Jesus Christ was weeping with his face buried in the dirt. He had no personal reason to be there. The only reason he's there is because God loves you. The only reason Jesus, the divine son, could experience agony was because he voluntarily chose to die for me. That is the only reason. There is no other reason that the son of God would suffer and be in agony and feel sorrow even unto death to anticipate facing his father on the cross except that he and his father chose to glorify themselves by saving sinners. So that Jesus is dedicated to the father's glory and that glory is revealed in God's love of rescuing sinners. So the first thing we do when we are facing mystery and we will This life is full of mystery. Your intentions don't turn out the way you thought they would. How many of us can can understand that? My intentions, my efforts don't turn out the way I thought they would. I I, I did this with my family or with my spouse or, or in some relationship, and I had the expectation that this would produce a certain result, and then it doesn't produce that result. Every parent can can feel the pain of that 
What do you do when you face that mystery? When your best efforts have been discarded or when you face a moment where where something takes place in your life and you're experiencing pain and suffering and torment through nothing you did. You were innocent in that sense and yet something came charging into your life and, and produced a chaos and a destruction. That happened to people the last few weeks. That happens to people all the time in this world. You get bad news about sickness or bad news about a child or bad news about your job or, or bad news about the, 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 the health of someone you care about. That happens to people all the time. Mystery and suffering come charging into life. And, and what do we do when we, we feel that mystery? Why? I, I haven't done anything to cause this. Or even if I did do something to cause this suffering, I I have no way of of overcoming it now. I'm caught in the pain of it. I'm caught in the crushing grip of this mystery. And I'm, I'm looking to God and I'm asking, why, Lord? For a Christian, this mystery comes rushing in and it's confusing and it undermines faith and hope and and questions our trust in a good and loving God. What do we do with that? Well, one thing we can do is we can take our doubting heart to Gethsemane and sit with Jesus a while while he cries in the dirt. And we can say, whatever else is happening here, this certainly is happening. Jesus is weeping because he loves me. So whatever I don't know, I can take that to the place where I do know. I don't know why this, but I do know why that. And the why of that is sufficient to sustain us in the I don't know of all these other unknown mysteries. I, I don't know this, and maybe I never will. Listen, some mysteries are not answered in this life. You just have to be prepared for that as a Christian. Some mysteries are never answered in this life. To to give maybe the the greatest biblical example other than Jesus, uh, consider Job. Do do you realize that God never told Job, as far as we know in the story, God never told Job why? He was never told why. Why? In one sense, if you read the book, we're not even told why. Why Job? Why Job's children? Why Job's life? We're just told who. We're not told why. We're told who. God loves you. And whatever else is happening in this mysterious suffering that you're facing or that you're aware of, you can go to Gethsemane and say this, look, I I know that the God who is in charge of that loves me. Why? Because his own son is crying in the dirt in Gethsemane and will hang on a cross to pay for my sin. I don't know why, but I know who. I know him, and I know he loves me, and I will take this mystery, and I will lay it down at the feet of the one who cried in the dirt for me. It compels us to trust his mystery first by reminding us of God's love that does not explain every mystery, but it guarantees to us that every mystery works under the sovereign providence of a God who loves us enough to die for us in the person of his son. A second and lesser but still valuable thing I think Gethsemane speaks to us is it speaks to us through Jesus' example. Because like Jesus, we also can say, Father, take this from me. Yet, your will and not mine. Do you know that Jesus in his human nature, for the first time in eternity, had to live with a certain level of mystery? Do you realize that? That's part of the righteousness that he gives to us, that not knowing he still trusted. It's a mystery of of the incarnation, the two natures of Christ. You can read about it. Lots of books and written in church history has tried to explain this mystery. Basically comes down to two natures, one person. God, God the Son exists in a divine nature, knows everything, can do anything, and a human nature 
who doesn't know everything and can't do everything. So you have this experience where he truly and fully experienced the reality of mystery and not knowing and yet trusting God. And that righteousness he gives to us when we don't know and so we charge God, he gives to us the righteousness of not knowing and yet trusting God. And that's good news. Because how many times have you not known and yet doubted God? And so we needed a righteousness to cover us of someone who didn't know and yet trusted God. And we also need that example so we can follow after him and say, Lord, I I don't like this. Make it go away. I'm hurting, Lord. Make it go away, Lord. Make it go away from my child, from my wife, from my life, from my friends, from my community. Make it go away. And yet, I know that your goodness is not limited by my understanding. God's goodness is not limited by our understanding. And that's a good thing. We might assume that our understanding is better than God's. Jesus assumed that God's understanding in his human nature was better than his. So we trust God's love revealed in Gethsemane. We also can look at Jesus and see in him the founder and perfecter of our faith and follow after him. Lord, this is a mystery. This makes no sense to me at all. Please take this away. Yet, not as I will, but as you will be done. Gethsemane compels us to trust God in mystery because it reveals God's love for us and it also reminds us that if Jesus Christ walked this path before us in union with him, we can walk our much lesser path behind him. Finally, Gethsemane reminds us that he will take our tears away. Why does it do that? It does that because of the resolve expressed. Not as I will but as you will. And then if you can drop down to verse 46, we see that he has had enough time of prayer and now Jesus Christ rouses his disciples and declares with authority, rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Gethsemane reminds us that this decision that Jesus made was something he would not be thwarted from doing. No temptation around him, no fear of facing that cross would stop him from doing his Father's will, from going to that cross, and it reminds us that chapter 26 of Matthew, or the various other chapters where Gethsemane is referenced in Mark and Luke, are not the end of the story, they are the purchase of the story. They are the purchase, they are the price tag, so that one day he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Why was the invulnerable Son of God vulnerable to grief? So that one day we could be made so as well. Why was the invulnerable divine son who cannot face pain, who cannot face torment, who cannot face suffering, who is not able to be taken captive, who cannot be killed, killed and crushed and agonized and suffered? Why does that happen? Well, it's so that all the people who could easily experience that for the rest of their life and all eternity may one day experience his kind of invulnerability to that pain. There's a great exchange of tears that takes place. An exchange of tears. And you know that because he promises to wipe away tears from our eyes. Not just because he can ignore sin, but because he's already borne the weight and curse of it so that we can experience life like it was for him before he came to earth. So he experienced life as it is for us on earth so that one day he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. 
Gethsemane reminds us that it is just one step until the final journey. Imagine if the Bible ended at the end of Gethsemane. What would we have? We would have what countless other religions have. Be a stoic sufferer. Be willing to endure. Go forward with a placid look on your face. But we do not have a Bible that ends here. We have a Bible that calls this just one stage that leads to a final consummation. As Paul says in Romans 8, 18 through 25, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility. And don't things feel futile in weeks like this? Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And can't you feel that when you look at the evil of this world? Can't you feel that? The groans of childbirth. This is, out of my mind, painful. Not only the creation, But we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies, for in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. That's what we feel like right now. The groans of childbirth. This world is broken. Things are futile. Our best efforts fall short. Something is wrong. And yet there is a hope for something new. So Jesus said to his disciples on this same night, let not your hearts be troubled. Really, Jesus? Because you've been saying you're going to die. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go, and that path led through Gethsemane and through Calvary, that's the only way he could go. If I go and prepare a place for you, in other words, here's the logic. If I'm doing this painful, dreadful thing, what can you be sure of? If the invulnerable Son of God is going through Gethsemane and through Calvary, what can you be sure of? Why would I do this unless there's an outcome? That's the logic. Why would I do this unless there's an outcome? If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. And then the great tear exchange in Revelation 21.4. He, God, will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. Let's just read these exchanges together and feel the glory of Jesus Christ in this. My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Brothers and sisters, all of us have tears that need to be wiped away. All of us have tears whether we're criers on the outside or not, we all have tears. 
You know what your tears are. You know it's coming to mind. You know what your tears are. You know what the future tears are. You're afraid you might have to cry someday. You know what your tears are. Jesus wept in that garden and then declared he was going to meet his betrayer and to that cross because one day those tears God will take away from you and they will never come again. Let's pray. Father, we come to you with our burdens and we lay them at your feet. Lord, I pray for all those with parenting burdens. Lord, that you would comfort them Savior of Gethsemane, would you comfort them right now? Lord, I pray for those with physical burdens. Lord Jesus, would you comfort them right now? Heal them and sustain them. Lord, those with grief for this evil world burdens. Lord, right now, By faith, would you dry their tears? Lord, we we all know we, we have a few moments left to go. It's not very long. It feels long to us, but it's not very long. Just a few moments left of faithful trust. A few moments left of fighting for faith. A few moments left of enduring, of bearing one another's burdens. Just a few moments. And then our tears will be wiped away. We thank you. And we love you. What I'd like to do, if I can, is um, invite um, either Rob or Juan to just come up just to play behind me a little bit. Um, So if one or both of you guys can make your way up, that'd be great.